Well, we are continuing um, in this kind of long section dealing with sin and the law. Um, we will we'll read again. I normally will have us read this whole thing, but for time's sake, we'll just read the section that in hopes we're covering today. Um, but uh, So we'll read the, just this first paragraph on the front of, um, of your handout, Romans 7.7 7, through verse 12. Paul says, what, shall, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for, what I, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous and good. <clears throat> and so we'll pick up in our notes. Um, we are in the last major Roman numeral in your um, section, Roman numeral 7. We are on point D. And we left off looking at um, lowercase Roman numeral 3. How does sin use the law to produce these desires? And again, I would remind you, this is kind of a, um, a parenthetical insertion. This section is a parenthetical insertion into Paul's main argument. Okay, um, Paul is dealing with um, this accusation that he is um, well known at the time to be a libertine. And again, I... I uh, I think it's amusing because no one looks at Paul today and says, that guy, he is a libertine, right? Um, I'm not sure anyone preaches obedience more than Paul in terms of the New Testament writers. Um, but at the time, um, in contrast to the Jewish people, who, um, who of course had this um, high regard for the law, Paul appears to them to be someone who is pushing freedom um, and, and ignoring the law. And so, with Paul's argument that he's made so far in Romans, um, people are beginning to ask that question, like, well, wait a second. Um, is the law bad? And so Paul deals with that head-on here in this passage, while also giving us an understanding of, of our own relationship with sin. We won't go into the whole ego thing, Ego, when Paul says, I, me, or my, it is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Greek word ego. Um, and and there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot of intricate, um, I think, interpretation of this that doesn't really matter for the whole passage, but it does have implications for later. Um, you're welcome to go through the notes on your own, or if, if you want, you can go back to previous videos. May God have mercy on your soul um, to do that. Um, but uh, but so now we're kind of now digging into the text. And so we're in verse 8a. And you'll remember, uh, we talked a little bit about, and I think this is important again, I'm going to stress it again because it's going to come up again, that sin is not rule-breaking. Sin is not rule-breaking. Well, we teach it as such. Sin is rebellion. It is rebellion against the Lord. And that's a really, really important point. Now, does that include rule breaking? Yeah, sure. But when we limit it to rule breaking, we teach the concept that if you just keep the rules, then you're good to go. Then you don't sin. When in fact, sin with the law leads to transgression. And you'll remember that as we've worked through Romans, We've talked about the idea that transgression is a, is a word that is related to the law. And so Paul's general argument that he's making here in Romans chapter 7 is that the law takes sin and it gives it a, a beachhead, a place to operate from. 
Okay, so the context is we're all sinners, but the law is our rebellious nature. That's what sin is, is our rebellious nature comes forward, it will rebel against the law. Okay, and so that's what Paul's saying. So no, the law is not bad. The law is good, it is just, it is holy. But our sin nature uses the law to provoke that rebellion that is within us. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what we'll be talking about. And you'll remember um, this first point, I just want to say it again. You know, practically, we all know that rules can provoke us to violate them. Um, and I, I told the story about the ride at Disneyland, Raiders of the Lost Ark. They have a sign that says, don't pull the rope, because they expect you to pull the rope. Mm -hmm. Right? And so you pull the rope, and, you know, it's, it's Indiana Jones hanging in a well, and he yells at you for pulling the rope. But they do that intentionally, because they know as soon as they put the sign up, you're going to violate it. And everybody does. Everybody walks by and pulls the rope and, and you hear it. It's, it's a fascinating, I think, commentary on our nature. Okay? We had a, a great discussion about speed limit, and so this week that was on my mind. <laughs> All along, right? But, okay, so moving on here. Uh, and I mentioned that Paul likely intends a more theological interpretation that he covered in the first three chapters of Romans. See, we stand in rebellion against God. When God tells us to be obedient, our sin nature leads us into rebellion. And we see Exodus 24 is an example of this. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water, or under the earth. So Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, he's receiving the law, and then Exodus 32, 1, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. The God who parted the seas is no longer important to them. They need an image. They need something to draw their attention to. And so they say, uh, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us Elohim who shall go before us. I want to make that point that the gods that they say are the word, or is the word, Elohim. <coughs> the very same word that is used in Genesis 1.1. Okay? They want a visual representation of of the God that they clearly have seen act so that they can worship the visual representation, but clearly in violation of the Ten Commandments. See, what happens is we get the law and that rebellious nature of sin within us immediately leads us into rebellion. I mean, you couldn't see it any quicker than with the people as they waited for Moses to come back down from Mount Sinai. It is part and parcel who we are. We love ourselves to the point of wanting to be the rule maker. To be the one that gets to define what is good and evil. Which is somewhat reminiscent of Eve in the garden, maybe. Right? Isn't that the sin? I want to have the ability to choose what is good and evil. Which is to say, I want to be God. And that is the danger of sin. Sin is rebellion against God. And so, moving on to point E there, uh, Paul says, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. And interestingly, this is um, the Hebrew chiastic structure that we see um, as, as uh, Paul tries to demonstrate um, how the law becomes a beachhead or perhaps a base for sin to operate from. Dead sin comes to life as the living ego dies. Apart from the law versus when the commandment came. Sin lies dead. Sin came alive. I was once alive. I died. So this is this chiastic arrangement that we see here. So apart from the law. Now we've discussed this idea. Did Paul covet? Right? Some people say, well... 
yes. Some people say, yeah, that coveting was sexual in nature. Uh, I think that's all a stretch that the text doesn't give us. Um, Paul is using coveting as an example, covetousness as an example. You will remember that um, for the Hebrew people, the summation of the law was seen in the idea of not coveting. So again, I just want to set that contrast. To the Hebrew people, the summation of the law was thou shalt not. In contrast with what Christ said, the summation of the law was, you shall, right? You shall love the Lord your God. You shall love your neighbor. So I think it's very fascinating. It reveals, I think, a lot of, of the battle that um, Jewish people, as they heard the gospel, had to struggle against. They struggled against an entire training, their entire life, of what they shouldn't do to be righteous, as opposed to loving others as a component of the righteousness imparted to them through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So, again, though Paul may have experienced this covetousness personally, the meaning here is likely that Paul experienced this as a result of his corporate identity with Israel. So, um, not to go back to ego, I, me, my, who's Paul talking about? Um, this idea is that Paul personally felt this way, but he also felt this way as a representative member of Israel. Okay? Um, you can read through that all later again if you choose. Um, but in other words, this is not... Um, at one point, I suddenly hit an age of maturity and I became aware of the full force of the law. That's, that's not what Paul's talking about. He's not saying before Adam received the commandment in the garden. You'll remember this, right? That one of the key problems with do we view this as Paul? It was Paul alive. So a rule of interpretation. The death that Paul contrasts alive with is eternal death, right? And so when we interpret Scripture, if that's eternal death, then the life must be eternal life. Well, how did Paul have eternal life um, before he understood the law? Well, the only person that we can rightly say, apart from Christ, who, uh, who was around before the law and was alive, well, of course, was Adam. Okay, but this, uh, for other reasons, cannot be Adam. Instead, basically what Paul is saying is that sin was not as powerful or active before the Mosaic Law was given and provoked it to life. Okay? Um, you'll remember... Abraham sinned before the law. Right? So that law existed, written in our hearts, but not the Mosaic Law. So the Mosaic Law it only serves the purpose we read in Galatians to be our, tu our tutor, our teacher to Jesus Christ. So Paul says in verse 9, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came... Sin came alive and I died. So again, once alive apart from the law is very likely not a reference to Adam. It is not a reference to Adam. It is true of Paul in this sense. It relates to his affiliation with the Jewish people. Okay? We know that Paul was born a sinner before he understood the law. Right? Scripture is very clear. David talks about that in Psalm 51. We are born sinners. So clearly he was not spiritually alive before the law. You'll remember uh, I told you that this is where some people begin to point for an age of accountability. Like at two, you're a sinner, but it doesn't matter. Well, that's, that's in no way a scriptural idea. We are guilty before God for the law. I had someone tell me that well, a person who's handicapped, right, who has the, um, the mental capacity of perhaps a, a five-year-old, well, they'll be fine in heaven. Where do you get that scripture? Now, I think their understanding of faith is very different, and thankfully, we believe in the doctrine of election because the Bible teaches the doctrine of election. Um, but this idea that somehow, like, their sin is cool before God... That is not scriptural at all. 
So again, not a reference to Adam. Probably relates to Paul and how he affiliates with the Jewish people. Mu believes that alive refers in a relatively theological sense to the situation of Israel before the law was given. Okay? In other words, sin existed. That wasn't the problem. Rebellion existed. Romans 1-3 through 3 is very clear about that. But when the law came, it aggravates sin so that we now know, okay, I am violating a positive command from the Lord. And since then, eternal life could not apply to Adam, but the law, or, or could apply only to Adam, but the law could not, alive is likely a relative term. It relates to the situation of Israel. It could also mean simply existing in just kind of a generic sense. Um, he does use it that way at times. I don't believe that's the case here. Schreiner, the other commentator that I use pretty heavily, um, believes that there is more of a reference to being spiritually, spiritually alive than what Mu uh, counts for. Um, and some of you have suggested this as well. And I, I kind of lean that way. Um, that Paul is speaking about his relationship to the law. In other words, before Paul was saved, he thought he was doing pretty well and was alive because he was keeping the law. Okay? Um, and so he's looking back. Uh, I would suggest that the difference between Mu and Schreiner is that Schreiner thinks Paul, looking back, believed himself alive until sin came, um, while Mu thinks that Paul refers to the time before the law came when sin lied dormant. And again, I would tend to lean more towards Schreiner in this, um, with the understanding that Paul is representative of the people, and he holds himself as the example of that very truth. So in other words, Paul is not simply talking about himself here. By the way, um, the tenses that Paul uses in his verbs in the first section differ than he does in the second section, which we'll do next week, Lord willing. Starting a new handout next week, Lord willing. But um, the tenses change. Those become much more autobiographical than they are here. Okay, so it appears even by verb tense that Paul is pointing to the idea of representing, uh, of him, but him representing Israel writ large. Either way, both agree that neither Paul nor Israel were free from the reign of sin. That, I think, has got to be the underlying foundation to the argument. Neither Paul nor Israel was free from sin before the law. What the law did was stir up that sin because it became a beachhead for the rebellion against God to act. Okay? And so when the commandment came, sin came to life. And Paul says in verse 10, the very commandment that the promised or that promised life proved to be death to me. Now that's a reference back to Leviticus chapter 18. Uh, in Leviticus, it says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Well, the Hebrew nation took that as if we keep the law, we will be saved. To which I would just want to ask, how's that working out for you? How's keeping the law working out for you? Right? Although... Although there may be a sense of this, it probably does not refer to eschatological eternal life. If it does, if Leviticus does refer to as eschatological um, eternal life, then the, the obvious response to that is that it's talking about Jesus as the only one who is able to keep the law. Okay? Um, and so... As sin came to life, the ego died, right? So the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. No one besides Christ before was able to keep it. Right? We read this in Romans 3. Again, a passage we've constantly referred back to. Any sense, any sense that you could keep the law 
according to Pauline theology, according to Pauline authorship, is, is torn asunder here in Romans chapter 3. Verse 9, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. And you'll remember that that is a, a firm statement by Paul. When he says, no, not at all, he might as well say, what are you, an idiot? No way. Okay? Are we better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, remember Greeks, not simply the, the nation that we think of as Greece, but um, a, a use of Paul here for Gentiles. So everybody, both Jews and everybody else are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. This is the definition of sin is rebellion, is it not? Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Not one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Talk about a word you have to be careful to pronounce right. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So this is a constant theme for Paul, yes? Throughout Romans, it's a constant theme. Why? Because the laws are tutored. We see that in Galatians 3, verse 19. In Galatians, Paul writes, Why then the law? What's the point of it? Why is it here? It was added, Paul says, because of transgressions. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, of course, Jesus Christ, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. So again, we see Paul dealing with people, accusing him of being a libertine. For if a law had been given that, would, that could give life, then righteousness would, in be, would, would indeed be by the law. But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian, our tutor, our teacher, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The law was our tutor. Its purpose was to point to Christ. This is why we can say, or why Christ can say that He is the fulfillment of the law, because He's the only one that can keep the law. And then third there, the law turned sin into transgression in the in, and in this way, Paul, as a representative of the Jewish people, can say that it led to his death. So it leads to their death, and it leads to his death. So understand what Paul's doing. Paul's saying, remember who I am, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Right? Like, you know, he says in, in Galatians, like, if anyone can boast, look at me. I can boast. Right? So this idea, this idea that Paul is saying, look, I as part of our people am a part of this like elite group of people who believe strongly in the law. He's using himself then as a representative that's true of him, but it is also true of the people. And so in this first section, um, as... He's not writing as autobiographically as he's looking back at the people of Israel. His point is that the law is good, but man's sinfulness corrupts the law through our rebellion. Okay? Again, 
Again, this may point to his recognition before or after his conversion that he was imprisoned under law leading to death, or it may refer to the sin-stirring force of the law leading to death. So I take that as you will. Then Paul says, For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. Okay? Sin, seizing an opportunity, gaining a beachhead through the law, deceived me, and through it killed me. Now again, before Paul understood the law, was he a sinner? Of course. Right? We, we see that clearly in Scripture. It's part of the reason why we have the virgin birth. Right? Because we are born into sin. And so Paul returns into the language of verse 8. But now instead of the law providing the opportunity for sin to produce these sinful desires, now sin deceives and kills. And Moo thinks here that Paul is referring to the deception brought about by the Jewish belief that they could obtain life through the law. Which I think is a, a fair assertion. Right? Remember, even going back to the idea that, that the Jews' rabbinical teaching taught that, that Abraham would sit at the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, and, and turn anyone who was circumcised around. You know, it's interesting. Um, uh, I watched a movie that was dealing with uh, the mafia this weekend. And uh, in that movie, there was a lot of baptism of babies, right? And um, if you've ever been to uh, a Catholic christening, what do they believe about baptism? Yeah, that, that, that gives salvation. Right? That's no different than the Jews who believe that circumcision gave salvation. Right? Keeping the law. Keeping the rules. And I was at um, uh, a funeral on Thursday that uh, was a Catholic funeral. And again, they read last rites. I mean, there's this constant, like, you got to do these things to be saved. It's very similar, um, which, by the way, is what leads us to that, like, we have to be careful of legalism thing, right? That somehow legalism promotes an idea of work salvation. But that's what it points to. It points to exactly what the Hebrew people believe. But their attempts to find life through the law only stirred sin into greater transgression. Do you get that? But in other words, when you're given a law, again, we could use the speed limit signs, right? And like we get stirred into greater transgression. For example, be in a hurry somewhere. What if your wife's pregnant and her water broke and you're trying to race her to the hospital? Is it okay to break the law? We can find good reasons to do that, can't we? That's part of our sin nature. It's part of um, who we are in our flesh. As sin went to work through the law, Jewish attempts to keep it brought death because they could not fulfill it. They honored the law, but they could not practice the law. But just think about the ways in which the Pharisees attempted to fence in the law. Where they take a law from God and they go, okay, well, we've got to tell everyone what that means. right? We've got to build fences around that law so everyone knows the terrain that that law covers. And if when you think about how the Pharisees fenced the law, how the Pharisees looked to the law and said, okay, well, we've got to make sure that this is applicable so that everybody can check the boxes. And what did that lead for the, the Pharisees to what does Jesus call them again? Hypocrites, Hypocrites and brood of vipers. vipers. So they're in their attempt to keep the law, all it did was prove the inability of man to keep the law. They honored it, but they could not practice it. Um, this is the purpose of verses 14 to 15, which we'll come to next week. Lord willing, to demonstrate that Israel was under the curse of the law. They were under, under the, the curse of sin. The law of sin. Yet we should remember that Israel's captivity under sin had the positive effect 
of pointing to Jesus Christ as their Savior. As one who had come. So, verse 12. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and it is righteous, and it is good. So, Paul's whole point in this section is to prove that it, the law is not bad. We have a rebellious nature. And the law provokes that rebellious nature, which causes us then to recognize our true standing before God. Our true standing before God. Again, Paul dealing with this charge um, that, that he is a libertine. That he's saying get rid of the law entirely. Never what Paul says. Never what Paul says. Paul is not a libertine. It just shows, by the way, like, again, I would suggest to you, um, you know, if you read anything from MacArthur um, and the, the ideas of obedience, right? He draws strongly from Paul. In fact, he wrote uh, a book, I think, The Gospel According to Paul, which was his follow-up to The Gospel According to Jesus. Um, Paul is by no means considered a liberty, which shows you how legalistic the Jewish system was. Right? That they would look at Paul and call him a libertine. And it probably speaks to the idea of how libertine we have become. That we look to Paul and think, oh man, that guy, he's a legalist. He preaches obedience a lot. So, I would argue Paul hits a sweet spot that both the Jews and we miss. Paul says again, is the law sin? By no means. It is holy. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. <clears throat> and so here Paul is describing the origin of the law. Because God is holy, because God is righteous, and because God is good, then His law must be the same. It is holy and righteous and good. Why? Because God is holy and righteous and good. He cannot act outside of His attributes that define Him. Right? He is holy and righteous and good. We don't always like that. If we're honest, sometimes holy, righteous, and good seems pretty far off for us. We hear of a 22-year-old having a stroke and we begin to question. I think I told you, this 25-year-old girl that, that died that worked for the port of entry, her mom, right away, I'm so mad at God. Well, why? Because we don't recognize that God is holy and He is righteous and He is good. And so the way in which He acts will always be holy, righteous, and good. Period. Uh, Israel's experience with the law fits the paradigm of all people who are confronted with God's law in various ways. We cannot be saved by our efforts to keep the law, but by the grace and mercy of our Heavenly Father through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Period. It's the only way we can be saved. And in fact, what, what is different? I won't say what sets apart. I think that equates Christianity with other religions. But when you look at all other world religions, it's what are you doing to be saved? It is only in our faith that you can't do anything to be saved. All you can do is believe that the job was done by Jesus Christ. We cannot be saved by our efforts to keep the law. And Paul ends this chapter by saying, Wretched man that I am. Let's just pause for a second. Have you ever done like, like I have? Where you look at Paul saying, Wretched man that I am, and think, Whoa, well, Paul, you've never met me. <laughs> have you ever been there? If not, get there. If you don't recognize how big a sinner you are, that's probably a problem. Paul says, wretched man that I am, 
Who will deliver me from this body of death? When he gets into the autobiographical section of this, and Paul looks at his own heart, Paul says, I am horrible. I am rotten. Self-esteem that, would you? I hear people talk all the time about self-esteem. You ought to, you ought to take pride in yourself. Take pride in that. How wretched you are. Is that what we're saying? But what is there to take pride in? Wretched man that I am. I look to the Apostle Paul and I think, man, this guy, whew, he's pretty amazing. And he says about himself, wretched man that I am. By the way, that is a characteristic of the most godly men and women that I've ever known. People who are absolutely aware of their own sinfulness. People who are grieved before God of their own sinfulness. Now, with the caveat here that they are grieved for their sinfulness and thankful for what God has done. And what does Paul come to next? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's Paul. He's looking in the mirror. Right? He's looking in the mirror. Look how bad I am. When I scour the depths of my heart, I recognize the sinner that I am. Who can save me? Who can save me? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can see this, can't you? Hopefully you've experienced that same feeling that when you're looking at the depravity of your own soul that you go, yeah, who can do this? I can't do this. But thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then Paul says, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Augustine wrote of this um, God's command that we cannot do, or God commands that we cannot do, that we may know what we ought to seek from Him. What a powerful quote that is, right? God commands what we cannot do so that we may know what we ought to seek from Him. And Calvin said, in the presence of the law, God is but the rewarder of perfect righteousness which all of us lack, and conversely, the, the severe judge of evil deeds. But in Christ, His face shines full of grace and gentleness, even upon us poor and unworthy sinners. You know, I was able to preach probably two years ago now on this very subject. Right? Understanding, first of all, who God is. Understanding who we are which we can sum up in the words, not God, though we try to. Who God is and who we are apart from Christ, but who we are in Christ. And so this is Paul teaching this idea of the law creating the beachhead for sin to act out. And so we've talked a little bit about um, the legalism aspect of this, that we have to be careful of being legalist, as the Jews were, right? Telling everyone what they shouldn't do. Um, and instead, focusing on the law of love that we see from Christ. There's clearly things in Scripture that we're called to do. Um, but I wanted to, this, this, this study um, is called Romans, a letter to the church in America. Right? And so I want to connect this back to us as we enter into this political season. So this is kind of an advanced preview of Romans 13. Um, so I'm reading a book right now. Troy, what's it called? The, the Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory. Like yeah, Kingdom, like Power, and the Glory. I was getting confused. Um, it's by a guy named Tim Alberta who's a, a political commentator. He's a little left of center, I would argue. Um, but he's looking at the church in America and how the church has sold itself out for political power. Okay? Uh, and uh, I don't agree with everything he says. Um, we get together and we talk about it. I don't agree with everything it says. Um, but I will tell you that I think he's on to something. 
The church has sold itself out for political power. Okay, cool. Now what? How shall we then act? How shall we then live? And Paul deals with that in Romans. Um, you see it also from Peter in 1 Peter. You see it in Titus. You see it in 1 Timothy. But I want to kind of talk about this a little bit. How does this relate to our view of national laws, national legislation? And you could take it on down the line. In 2004, anyone remember what the state of Ohio did? The state of Ohio, so 2004, not that long ago, would you agree? In 2000, yeah, don't say that. It makes me feel old. I, the mirror does a good enough job of that. I so in Ohio, um, in 2004, they passed a constitutional amendment. Is that easy to do? No. Okay. So they passed a constitutional amendment defining marriages between one man and one woman in the face of the growing homosexual marriage um, issue in this country. 20 years ago. Actually, right now it's less than 20 years ago because they did it during the election. In fact, that helped George Bush win the 2004 election. Um, because uh, people turned out exceedingly well to vote in that amendment. You may remember this is my former job, right? Um, not too many years later, the Supreme Court ruled in Obergefell v. Hodges that, um, that forbidding homosexuals to get married was a violation of the Constitution's 14th Amendment. Okay? Now, you might say, well, that ruling was super close. It was five to four. Of course, it split down ideological lines. Um, but if you are a nerd like me, and I am a nerd, um, and you read the dissent, so the four conservative justices who ruled um, against gay marriage in Obergefell v. Hodges, do you know what their reason was? It wasn't that homosexuality is a sin. It wasn't that it was a perversion of marriage. It wasn't that there's a long history of the United States of marriage being between one man and one woman. The Obergefell ruling said that this is only a state decision and therefore could not be prohibited. Does that sound familiar? Have we heard a ruling recently that was similar? Like, let's talk about the Dodd ruling, right? So the Dodd ruling before the Supreme Court, has that fundamentally changed the issue of abortion in this country? Absolutely not. In fact, uh, they believe that there are more abortions done this year than before the ruling. In fact, what it has done is opened up the door now. This is working its way through the court system as we speak. But it has opened up the door um, for the, the morning after drug to be shipped to people throughout the country. So if you live in a state like Wyoming that says, well, we're, we're kind of there, but who says that abortion is illegal, you can still get the prescription shipped to you if you want. So did Dodd actually help? I don't know. I know there were a lot of Christians doing victory laps and yet, fundamentally, nothing's changed. The only thing that you could say changed is that is is now become a political issue, uh, causing Republicans to lose congressional seats over it. Any disagreement there? I mean, that's what happened in the last midterm. And so, when we look at this issue, when we look at this issue, I think it's important for us to talk about. What should be the Christian's role politically in this country? You know, it's interesting when you look at when you look at the Bible, Gentiles were not expected to keep the Mosaic law. Gentiles were not expected to keep it. In fact, they, they couldn't. It was unless they started with circumcision and moved from there forward. But Gentile Christians not expected at all. You may remember when 
Paul confronted Peter in Galatians 2. This is what he says. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. How would you like to have been there for that one? <laughs> Paul opposing Peter to his face. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. By the way, what does Peter say about Paul later? Do you remember? Peter talks a lot, very highly about Paul and his writings and the training that it gives us. Which I think is pretty cool about Peter. Um, for, Paul says, before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Remember, he'd had the vision and he could eat bacon like me now. Praise the Lord. But then... But when they came back, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So again, he began to act uh, according to his Jewish roots and tradition. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Do you think that we ought to pay attention when Peter and Barnabas are drawn into something that causes them to stumble? Like Peter. If Peter is falling prey to something, should we pay attention to that? Or should we just go, ah, I mean, it's a different time. No big deal. Peter and Barnabas both. Then Paul says, but when I saw that their contact their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So there's no application of the Mosaic law to the Gentiles. Oh, unless, of course, you want to get choosy. I like bacon, so that one, you know, kosher rule... We'll ignore that one. You know, that guy said he was a prophet and he was wrong. I don't really want to stone him because I might go to jail here in America for that. Right? So the Mosaic Law is not applied to the Jews. Now, I think there are elements of the Mosaic Law that we can point to, right? I think clearly in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, we can see ideas that apply to us today, that are something that we can still hold to. And national law does not have the force that the Mosaic law had. The law passed by the legislature, I don't know if they did yesterday or if it'll pass till Monday, um, but there's this little app called TikTok that they want to ban. Does that carry the force of Mosaic law? Certainly not. Certainly no one would hold to that. National law is to be obeyed, but does national law, appoint, does it point to Jesus as the Mosaic uh, law did? A ban on TikTok, a speed limit, clearly does not point to Jesus. Now you could make perhaps an argument that in <coughs> violating that, you could be called out on violating the law and that that, that would show you your need for a Savior. I think that's kind of a stretch at this point. And so as we try and force laws, and you pick whatever law is your the law that you want. Let's let's just pick homosexual marriage. We're gonna ban gay marriage in America. By the way, do any of us disagree that that's a sin? No. Of course not. Okay? But man, we're going we're gonna to ban that. We're going to lobby it. We're going to ban it. Are we asking unbelievers to act like believers if we enforce, if we try and enforce some sort of mosaic law? And if we're doing that, are we asking them to submit to a works-based salvation? In other words, what was your ability to keep the law before you're saved? Whatever law. Say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What was your ability to keep that before you were saved? <coughs> I mean, I don't know if the phrase less than zero actually means something, but it was certainly zero. You had zero ability to keep that law before you were saved. 
If you try and enforce that on unbelievers, what are, what are we saying? It's impossible. They cannot keep it. Now, I do believe that a large number of Christians living in a region uh, promotes a sort of common grace. Right? The laws reflect um, Christians if they're living in a godly way. Uh, I do believe that that has an effect on society writ, writ large. Does it eradicate sin in that society? Absolutely not. As the number of Christians in our country dwindles, we should expect that we will have a de decreasing influence on the laws of our land in a democracy. That should be your expectation. If it's not your expectation, pull the head out of the sand. You can try to enforce it. You can do your best. But I'm going to tell you right now, in a democracy, that cannot happen. And in fact, you could look at other godless nations. I mean clearly godless nations that have way way more strict and, shall we say, conservative laws than we have, and perhaps than we've ever had. I mean, there are countries in Africa you can go to today, and if you're gay, you, you will be executed for it. They're not Christian at all. I mean, let's talk about Idi Amin in, in Uganda. Let's talk about Angola. Let's talk about Iran under the, the Ayatollah Khomeini. I mean, the reality is there are godless nations all over the world that have, shall we say, again, conservative laws. It doesn't lead to salvation, strangely enough. See, I've been wrestling with this question of how we as believers ought to engage in the political and legislative environment in which we now live. How should we engage? This is super, super important. I would argue for a position that suggests that we stand for what is godly. We stand for what is godly, but with Christian lifestyle and understanding. Which I'll flesh out here momentarily. I would suggest that we stand for what is godly. We vote accordingly, but we do so without sacrificing who we are in Christ. So let me ask you, how, did it, how good a job did we do of that in 2020? How good a job did we do uh, standing for Christ but with our Christian testimony intact. Not well would be my, my view of that. My evaluation of that. We did not do well. So in other words, I believe that we can vote, that we can even lobby, perhaps even serve in government, on the basis of our faith. In other words, can you vote for a candidate that is pro-life? Absolutely. Can you vote for a candidate who believes that marriage is between a man and a woman? Absolutely. Should we be doing that? Probably. If we can find one. If you can find one. I don't know if you heard, but the president has now released uh, the, the former president has now released everyone who follows him um, from holding to the pro-life position, which is not shocking if you are a student of these things. But, see, this is what Paul did. Paul, when he appealed his, con his, his imprisonment and conviction, he appealed it to Caesar. That was his right as a Roman citizen. It's okay to use, to be a part of, to participate in, in all that it means, 
as a Christian in our government. We live in a democracy. You can do that. I think that's very clear scripturally. Uh, and by the way, I don't believe that we should delegislate morality. Okay, I mean, we shouldn't go looking for opportunities to delegislate morality. But I also don't think that you can successfully, or perhaps even should, legislate morality. Uh, you're enforcing rules on people who cannot keep them. By definition, according to Scripture, they cannot keep those rules. So should we attempt to legislate it? Well, my question for you is to what ends? Can to I, what ends? I read a really interesting book some yeah. time ago. Of, and the, the guy's uh, theory was that the, for all the pro-Christian activism in the past has caused the anti-Christian legislation to expand. Um, that's pretty similar to what we're reading, especially basically in the late 70s forward. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, we, we don't have time to go through some of the things I think that guy points to in his book, but I think it's very, I think that component of it is pretty accurate. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9. Verse 9 to 13, Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world. Do you get what Paul's saying? Paul's saying don't, don't associate with sexually immoral people. People, But by the way, I'm not talking about those that are outside the church. You should associate with them. Because, you know, that's actually what Jesus did. Strangely, Right? Jesus didn't go and say, hey, we've got to change these Roman codes. We've got to allow prostitution. When he was hanging out with prostitutes, what did he do? He was the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's who he was. He was sharing with them the good news. So Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. Since then, you would, not, you would need to go out of the world. Newsflash, the world doesn't look like the church. And if it does, that's a bad statement on the church. But now, Paul says, I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or an idolater or a reviler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what, what have I to do with judging outsiders? But, by the way, do you think that if you were to pass a law, and by the way, I'm saying you, but you know, there's a mirror sitting right here, right? Do we think that by passing some law, we're going to give greater judgment than they'll receive from God? For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. The focus is the church. The other thing I would suggest is that as we wade into this socio-political arena that we have here in America, we must do so reflecting the fruit of the Spirit. So, you want to lobby? You want to go down to Cheyenne and lobby the legislature on an abortion bill? Awesome. Do it. I think we are free to do that scripturally. But when you do it, how do you do it? When you do it, when you, when you say, I'm not going to wear a mask, are you doing that in a way that reflects the fruit of the Spirit? Important question. Because I would argue that what has happened is we've given up our Christian testimony in the world. In this country, anyway. Our political activities cannot harm our testimony. All of this, 
When you're involved politically, keep these things in mind. We must have the understanding that according to Peter and 1 Peter, we are exiles and we are strangers here. The world should look different. And passing laws won't change that. What changes it? The gospel of Jesus Christ. I would, I mean, I would suggest to you, you can send all the money you want to all the lobbyists that are doing all this thing. You have a much bigger effect by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, allowing him and the, the work of the Holy Spirit to change a person's heart. Have much greater impact than, than lobbying. But but again, I think we're free to lobby if we choose. We need to remember we are exiles, we are strangers here. We need to remember, and I think the church at times has forgotten this, that national law has no power to save. A person could abide by every law you want this nation to have, and they could still be damned to hell because they don't have faith in Christ. Another thing we need to keep in mind, we need to understand that we are to submit to this nation's laws regardless of whether or not we like them unless they call us to violate God's law. So, newsflash, if the government says wear a mask, guess what you better do? Probably ought to wear a mask, whether you like it or not. Brothers and sisters, I promise you, I had to wear a mask from before 7 a.m., drive all the way on a hot bus in sept early September, all the way to Rock Springs. Actually, it may have been August. All the way to Rock Springs, coach a game, get back on the bus with all the hot, sweaty boys. The mask may have helped with the smell some. Uh, all, the, all the way back to Sheridan, where we got here at like 3 or 4 in the morning, I had to wear a mask nonstop the entire time. Ask me if I like wearing a mask. I can assure you, I do not. And I'm not, listen, I'd like to say I'm not telling you that you should wear a mask if you're called on to, but I actually am telling you that. I am telling you that. Because we're called to submit to the law unless, unless it violates God's law. That's Romans 13, Titus, 1 Timothy, and in 1 Peter, which we'll read here as we conclude here in a moment. I would also suggest to you that if we misinterpret Scripture to justify violating national laws, that we are guilty of sin as well. For example, there was a person that some of you may remember who was anti-mask here. Listen. In Wyoming, we were given the power to choose what we wanted to do unless your job required it. So if you don't want to wear a mask, then don't wear a mask, right? I worked for the school district. I had to, so I did. Not because I wanted to, okay? But this person twisted scripture to try and find a place to prove that wearing a mask was unbiblical. Uh, you remember in 2 Corinthians when Paul talks about we look upon in a mirror with unveiled face? Well, see, that's why we shouldn't wear a mask. Ah. Look, I would argue that that's as sinful as anything else. When you are twisting Scripture for your own purposes, Christ came. We need to do this remembering whatever we do politically, socio-politically in our country. We need to remember that Christ came to establish a kingdom that is not of this earth. Right? You remember he said that to Pilate. Pilate said, are you trying to become a king? And he said, my kingdom is not of this earth. And yet, too many times we in the church try to make this a kingdom on earth. <laughs> God wants us more concerned with our behavior inside the church and sharing the gospel, and listen to this, honoring those outside the church. Let me read it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. 
Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Why? So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Do you get that? By you acting honorably to others, that can lead to their salvation. And then they'll glorify God in the end days. Be subject. Well, we don't like this. I mean, let's not look at the American Revolution through this lens. Be subject for the Lord's sake, not Kevin's sake, but be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So pause real quick. Um, one of the arguments for not submitting, like for example, to a national vaccine mandate, which by the way, I would be in opposition to. I would vote against that at any opportunity. Having said that, if they mandate it, how do you say that, how could you stand against it in a biblical way? You ever think about that? What, what of God's law does it violate? Well, some Christian thinkers have found ways to get around this. They go, oh, oh, no, see, what we're doing is we're, we're called to um, submit to the lesser magistrate. Well, what does Peter say? Peter says, be subject to the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor is supreme or to governors is sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. Now, how many things do you actually hear that in Scripture about? It is the will of God that you abstain from sexual immorality. Right? Like there are very few set of things that that is set up. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put silence. Uh, sorry, let me go back. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. And then Peter says, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Um, you can pull up at any given rally. You can go to Fox News and you can watch all the Let's Go Brandon stuff. You can see the bumper stickers on cars of people who proclaim Christ. If you don't know what Let's Go Brandon is, you can look it up later. Right? Not be appropriate for me to tell you. You maybe even have said it. I will tell you, I will tell you that it's hard for me to make the stretch that let's go Brandon equates to honor the emperor. By the way, sometimes it feels like we're living under an emperor, does it not? But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We are called to live different. Now, does that mean we un unplug? Go live in a cave in the Bighorns? No, absolutely not. Paul didn't. Does it mean that in a democracy we don't vote, we don't lobby, we don't do all the things that we're capable of doing as <laughs> citizens in this democracy? No, of course we do those things. But do we do them in a way that reflects Christ, that honors our political opponents, and honors God? That is the key to this. Let's pray.